All right, everybody, a very good evening to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome all of you, uh, both panelists and the members of the audience, on behalf of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, to the 39th webinar of the first series, which is part of the continuous webinar series organized aiming at continuous professional development. We have a viewership of attorneys at law, law students, and even non-professionals. Um, and we are glad that these weekly webinars reach out and bring together the members of the bar from North, South, East and West, as well as from overseas. So uh, once again, I welcome everyone joining us for today's webinar, which I am sure is going to be a beneficial one for both lawyers and non-lawyers engaging in the subject of taxation, as today's topic is tax law, and we intend to gain insight regarding the rules and regulations applied and the laws governing this area. Without further ado, let me now introduce to you the fabulous panel of experts who will be sharing their knowledge with you all. Uh, first, let me introduce to you Mr. Neomal Gunawardana, attorney at law. He's a partner at Nithya Partners and heads the banking and finance and tax teams at the firm. He was a state counsel at the Attorney General's Department and a senior tax manager at Ernst & Young, Chartered Accountants. Mr. Gunavardhana has been the legal advisor to the Board of Review of the Inland Revenue Department and is a lecturer at the Sri Lanka Law College. He also functions as a member of the Taxation Committee of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and a member of the tax faculty of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Sri Lanka. We also have with us Mr. Suresh Pereira, attorney at law. He is the principal tax and regulatory at KPMG Sri Lanka. He is also a fellow member of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, FCMA UK, and a Chartered Global Management Accountant, CGMA, and is a member of the CIMA Global Council and the CIMA Membership Committee. He also served in the CIMA Sri Lanka board for two years. He's a former regional board member of the AICPA Middle East, South Asia and North Africa, and is a member of the KPMG Middle East and South Asia Tax Steering Committee. He holds an LLB from the University of Colombo and is a tax lecturer and author of many press articles. Next, we have with us Ms. Panuja Pereira, attorney at law. She joined the Department of Inland Revenue in 2007 and is presently a senior deputy commissioner at the Department of Inland Revenue. She was also a tax policy advisor to the Ministry of Finance. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree and LLM and a Master's degree in Business Administration and Taxation. Let me also introduce to you Ms. Sharmin Thilakratna, Attorney at Law. She's a director of PricewaterhouseCoopers, providing tax solutions to a multitude of domestic and international clients. She has experience both in professional service firms and mercantile sector. She is an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants UK and a past finalist of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Ms. Tilakaratna has been involved in appeals on behalf of clients to the Commissioner General of Inland Revenue, Tax Appeals Commission and assisting legal counsel in tax litigation. Finally, let me introduce to you the moderator of the day, Mr. Niranjan Arul Prakasam, attorney at law. Mr. Arul Prakasam obtained his degree majoring in economics and law from the McAllister College USA and is a member of the Omicron Delta Epsilon Honor Society. He also has an MBA from INSEAD School of Business, France. He worked as an investment banking analyst at Merrill Lynch in New York and thereafter as an associate vice president at Amber Research, Sri Lanka. Ms. Sarul Pragasam was a consultant to the Ministry of Finance and a member of the Board of Directors of the Regional Development Bank. So that will be your panel today. They will be speaking to you on tax law. Uh, to begin with the discussion, I now hand over the session to Mr. Niranjana Rupragasam, the moderator of the day. I hope all of you have an informative and an enjoyable session. Over to you, Niranjan. Thank you. Can you hear me? I believe everybody can. Excellent. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on Tax Law Insights, organized by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Tax law is a very vast area of law and something that is very personal 
to each and every one of us, as Section 2 of the 2017 Inland Revenue Act requires every person with a taxable income to file a tax return. Now, 90 minutes it is hardly sufficient to cover the full gamut of tax law, but we have structured this session in such a way that our viewers get the most of the time allocated to us. So here, how, here is how it's going to work. The first 60 minutes will be dedicated exclusively to panel discussion. And our four esteemed panelists will cover four distinct topics. Our first topic will be tax policy and administration and will include things such as the national budget and tax collection. This will be covered by Tanuja Pereira. Our second topic is personal income tax and will include things such as rates, exemptions, penalties, and the time bar, and this will be covered by Sharmin Tilakaratna. Our third topic is capital gains tax. This will be covered by Mr. Suresh Pereira, and if time permits, he may briefly touch on value-added tax as well. Our fourth and final topic is tax appeals and litigation. This will be covered by Mr. Neymar Gunavardhana, and we'll deal with the appeal procedure available to taxpayers and the time bar. Now, immediately after the 60-minute panel discussion, there will be a question and answer session. I'm told that this webinar is uh, streamed live on Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook, and our viewers on Zoom can address or send across questions to me, which I will then direct to our panelists accordingly. So with that, let us begin. Our first topic is tax policy and administration. This will be covered by Tanuja Pereira, who has been instrumental with fiscal policy and the national budget, and whom I've had the privilege of working with when I was a consultant to the Ministry of Finance a few years ago. Tanuja, over to you. Thank you, Niranja. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, when it comes to the tax policy, uh, tax policy is designed by the Ministry of Finance, the Fiscal Policy Department according to the will of the legislature. Uh, we know that taxation is the major source of the revenue that finance the government expenditure. More than 90% of the government revenue is generated by way of tax revenue. Uh, although there are several other alternative methods, tax, taxation could be considered as the best source of government revenue because it has its own uh, the, uh, own benefits low cost easy to administer since there are the established authorities and can achieve significant revenue increase through a minor revision to the existing policy framework so the the government tax policies presented to the public through the annual budget mainly Every year, the annual budget is presented. The budget document is prepared by the government, presenting its anticipated tax revenue and the expenditure proposed for the coming financial year. The gap between the total tax revenue and the total expenditure, we call it budget deficit. So the budget deficit is bridged through the borrowings, both external and internal. When it comes to the tax policy, there are, main, there are mainly three authorities administering the taxes. Inland Revenue Department, Sri Lanka Customs, and the Excise Department. These three authorities administering different type of taxes. So the Inland Revenue basically doing this income tax, uh, value-added tax, and the stamp duty. Uh, customs import taxes and the excise department excise taxes. There are plethora of tax, there is a plethora of taxes in Sri Lanka, governed under different, different legislations. Uh, but these, uh, these taxes are not equally applicable for every person and every activity. Uh, depending on the nature of the person, depending on the nature of activity, the tax taxes they are liable differs. If you take the 2020, 2021 budget speech, the government presented the tax 
uh, revisions for the coming five years. And uh, the, the, the revenue, estimated revenue from the, uh, for the year 2021 is more than 2000 billion rupees. The expenditure estimated is uh, rupees billion 3000, more than rupees billion 3500. So this difference between the tax revenue and the ex estimated expenditure is, is uh, filled by the borrowing. And our, uh, when, when it comes to our tax system, it is, high, it is somewhat uh, criticized for having complexities and it is not uh, some people criticize that it is not capable of earning enough revenue there are reasons for these criticisms our tax revenue remains below 12 percent of the gdp of the country so this is not a this is uh, we can see this is a one of, this is one of the lowest in the region. If you look into our tax composition, direct taxes, that is the income tax, contributes to less than 20% of the total tax revenue. And the contribution of indirect taxes is more than 80% of the tax revenue. Uh, we, over the years, we have discussed, we have debated, we have disputed that we, our indirect tax should go down and our direct tax collection has to be increased. But still, we are below the expected levels. When it comes to the income tax, I want, I just want, I, I, I want to uh, highlight these figures, these numbers to, for you to understand where we are. When it comes to the income tax in other countries, normally the personal income tax revenue is much more than the corporate income tax. We have income tax, corporate income tax, and non-corporate income tax. This non-corporate income tax is the uh, income tax paid by the individual proprietorships and the pay tax paid by the employees. If you take India, the income, personal income tax, 82% uh, uh, of their income tax revenue consists of personal income tax. So the balance consists of corporate income tax. But in Sri Lanka, we are far below that. In Sri Lanka, income tax contributed by the individuals first at the personal level like profit professional like us is less than 20 percent of total income tax revenue but the, uh, this is not the case of the other countries and if you take govern uh, the, the country's employed population there are seven more than seven 0.5 million employed individuals. If you take pay liable or the pay uh, pay as you earn tax payers, it is uh, 1.2 million employees are registered for pay, pay making the pay payments. And when it comes to the individual tax files, business paper. Although there are more than 1.5 million individual businesses registered throughout the country, we have only 281,000 tax files. These records are taken from the uh, performance report published by the Inland Revenue Department for 2019. For the, two, for the year, to, uh, at the end of the year 2019, only 281,000 individual taxpayers, other than the payee, are registered with the Inland Revenue Department. So you see the difference. I mean, the potential is there, but we have only a, only a limited number of taxpayers registered with us. 
and uh, when it comes to corporate taxes the corporate tax the paid by the companies 56460 companies are registered with the inland revenue department at the registrar of companies more than 100000 company private companies are registered 4,375 4, public companies and 1,600 foreign companies are registered with the ROC. This, these numbers show us the, the upper tax registration, the upper ta tax penny, the, 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 the number of tax files are appro approximately less than 5% of the total potential if we take this all these uh, in businesses and individuals. So maybe our, uh, there might be issues with regard to the law, complications of law or certain other reasons for non-compliance of these things. I would like to draw your attention to the government's recent tax policy revisions. The rates are reduced while increasing the tax-free limits, leaving the space for the small businesses and low-income earners to grow. Tax administrators are required to have the setup for close monitoring of large taxpayers. So the government policy is more towards the monitoring of large taxpayers leaving a breathing space for the small scale uh, taxpayers and the small businesses to grow their businesses and concentrate on the high income earners. And we know that for a good tax system, there are must tax system should be consistent. The certainty must be there. It should be economical. So the government try to have these good to bring to incorporate incorporate these good features to the to our tax system. If you take the recent policy changes, government assures that the tax policy remains unchanged for five years, ensuring the certainty and consistency of the tax policy. This is an essential feature of a good tax system. And on the other hand, the, when, when you're uh, trying to tax or the, bring all these small scale, uh, uh, small medium enterprises and individuals, the cost, remain same for taxing, administering these small taxpayers and the large taxpayers. So con by concentrating to the large taxpayers, it would be much economical. And the other thing is the simplification. Uh, simplica simplification uh, announced in this budget is that remove the certain taxes have been removed. You know that NBT, nation building tax and the economic service charges was removed. At the same time, five key sectors that contributes to the tax revenue largely, that is liquor, tobacco, uh, betting and gaming, vehicles and the telecommunication. These five sectors proposed to be brought under one tax regime, one new special good and service tax regime. There are different laws governing these sectors, taxation of these sectors. If you take telecommunication, this, this consolidation or this kind of uh, consolidation of taxes is not a new thing. If you remember in 2011, in 2011, telecommunication levy was introduced consolidating the VAT and all other indirect taxes. Although it has been, it, it was changed later. The liquor and tobacco subject to excise duty. 
and at pen in be wet as well so all these uh, taxes are consolidated will be consolidated into one goods and service tax regime and uh, those taxes governed under several governed by several authorities under different pieces of legislations they will governed by one single authority and uh, under one law which is more simplified and uh, tanuja sorry to disturb you you have about 2 minutes okay fine thank you and uh, you know that uh, if we impose a tax it takes some time to to publish that as a law so still this gst bill is not published so we have to wait and see uh the uh, wait, wait wait till the gazette is published and see what the base rate administrative authority and other aspect of new gst would be so we have to wait and see that part right and uh, being lawyers so i think when a new legislation comes before it pass in the parliament it is gazetted and it is in the public domain so the to ensure that it covers everything and it is not ambig the, there are there the, it does not create any inequalities the being law as you can see whether there are any uh, uh, provisions that need to be changed so the at that time you can come out and either you can challenge it or you can propose to the minister of finance to get it get it changed this adverse uh, provisions rather than once it is passed and becomes a law sometimes people come out and criticize these things so uh, that is about the tax policy and basically numbers niranjan okay thank you thank you tanuja uh, there is actually a question for you but due to the time limit i'll get back to you during the question and answer session uh, mm -hmm. can we move on to our second topic uh, may i ask uh, sharmin tilakaratna to take over and cover personal income tax for us Ramin, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so during uh, my allotted time frame, I will uh, try to take you through the salient features of personal income taxation, the sources, uh, deductible expenses, how to allocate expenses, uh, some of the reliefs that are available under the law. Uh, some new reliefs were introduced recently through the budget. Uh, I'll take you through those reliefs as well. Uh, what are your tax compliance uh, requirements what are the forms you need to fill uh, what you need to be mindful of uh, with respect to your uh, deadlines and penalties um so i will be sharing a presentation uh, and i'll take you through this niranjan can you see my screen yes i can we're good to go okay okay so we'll start off with sources of income and uh, as is relevant to us of course we have our main source would be professional income which is also part it's part of your business income and we have of course employment income for uh, those who are in employment but which is uh, taxed or rather has a different set of rules so for the moment we will keep that out then we have uh, uh investment income so mainly we have these two buckets of uh, sources of income we have uh, professional income and investment income investment income you will have your sub sources such as rent renting rent income you get out of renting your properties interest income dividend and capital gains uh, capital gains will be addressed later so uh interest and dividends there has been a change uh, this year uh or effective january 2020 interest and dividends are no longer mandatorily subject to withholding tax at source it is only upon election of the recipient 
it is not mandatorily taxed at source and is no longer final tax. So those of you who have interest and dividends, uh, this source will no longer be a final tax. It has to be added on to all your sources of income uh, and uh, declared in your return and uh, you have to pay the taxes according to the progressive rates. So you have these sources, you add them all up, you arrive at your taxable income and you tax them, tax that income after allowing uh, for a 3 million tax-free allowance and a relief of 1.2 million, a further relief of 1.2 million, which I will come to as I go along. The tax rates are uh, progressive tax rates uh, with a minimum of 6% going up to a maximum of 18%. Uh, each slab at each slab of 3 million. So you start with a slab of 3 million each, so three, first 3 million at 6%, next at 12, and the balance at 18. And as uh, Tanuja mentioned, uh, 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 the contribution to uh, uh, taxes on the personal income tax side is low, and 18% uh, uh, in comparison to other countries, personal tax rate is actually very low. Uh, so we have been given a concession. Uh, it's, it was previously 24% uh, brought down to 18%. So moving on to deductible expenses of relevance. The main rule uh, for deducting your expenses, of course, is expenses incurred during the year in the production of income. Uh, that is the written law. Of course, moving away from that, there is an unwritten rule uh, which is used in practice. Uh, by the Inland Revenue Department and the policymakers, where especially, uh, which is applicable especially to those of us who are in profession and operate out of our, uh, our private residence, and uh, where it is not possible for us to identify the expenses directly, or it's a bit of a challenge because we have uh, both the uh, private, you have your private expenses as well as your professional expenses and income mixed up. Uh, the rule there is, and it's an unwritten rule, is that if you claim one third of your income as expenses, generally you're safe and will not be questioned further. So one third of your total income, if you claim as expense of your professional income, if you claim as expenses, generally you're safe and you won't be subject to much scrutiny. But that is an unwritten rule. The rule, but the legal rule is that expenses incurred during the year in the production of income can be deducted, and as such, even if it is more than one third of your total professional income, it can be deducted. So given here are some of the common uh, expenses that would uh, uh, we would uh, incur. Uh, books, your investment in your books, in your uh, text, it's considered as apparatus or tools of the trade. And there is a case to say that in case of a lawyer, your books it will be considered as, as planned and you can ca um, claim capital allowance uh, as a capital uh, allowance expenditure of 20% per year, so up to five years. Cost of traveling, the rule there again is traveling from home to place of uh, work is not allowed as a tax deductible expense, but traveling costs from a uh, place of business to another place of business is permitted. So if you are again operating out of your residence um, and you, as uh, your chambers is in your residence, so you tra travel from your chamber to your, say, to the courts or to your meetings or plant places or whatever would be permitted as a deductible expense. But again, the challenge here would be uh, how to uh, sustain it or prove it. So uh, what, is, what is required is that one is supposed to maintain a travel log uh, showing and, and being able to distinguish your private travel from your business travel. Rent paid and rent rates, again, can be claimed as deduction. So if you are uh, in a rented premises, you can claim the uh, rent paid. And again, if it is used for both private and your professional uh, place of work, then you allocate it on a reasonable basis. So what is a reasonable basis? Perhaps you take square foot area and allocate the rent based on square foot area. Same goes for utility, stationary. Uh, uh, you can either um, ensure you keep uh, a detailed and uh, robust set of documents to prove your expenses, or otherwise you have to allocate it or go by the general rule where one third of it will be allowed. That's your total, uh, from your total income, total expenses of one third will generally be not questioned. <coughs> so in addition, you have, of course, <coughs> deductions uh, for any service fee payments you make, any bad debts that are written off. <coughs> and of course your payments made to your staff and juniors. The non-deductible expenses are domestic expenses. So this is where the challenge lies to distinguish between your private and your professional expenses. 
any income tax you paid of course is not allowed interest and, and penalties and uh, expenditure incurred expenditure incurred in deriving exempt amounts are also not permitted now this again we need to be careful of and i will explain as i go along why that is and entertainment expenses not permitted so i'll move on to some exemptions of relevance <clears throat> Uh, this the first exemption was actually uh, an exemption that was there under the old act as well but there has been a slight change to it uh, and it has been made slightly more restrictive now um so the income you derive from any services rendered in or outside sri lanka to any person to be utilized outside sri lanka and which you receive in foreign currency and is remitted back to sri lanka would be exempt from income tax would be exempt from chargeability to income tax now here uh you have to be mindful of the words utilized outside sri lanka so the service you provide to that person outside sri lanka and that that person should utilize that service outside sri lanka if the service you provide to a, is uh, to a person outside sri lanka but that person uses that service in sri lanka theoretically the exemption is not available now these utilized outside sri lanka three words uh, is a new introduction from the or a new variation from the previous act then of course interest uh, from any your any foreign currency accounts which have been approved by the central bank of sri lanka are also exempt from income tax income from uh, foreign sources received in foreign currency and is remitted back to sri lanka would also be uh, exempt from income tax uh, there is a challenge here again in this uh, remitted back to sri lanka also although the act does not uh, specify a time limit by which the money should come back to sri lanka the inland revenue department tends to disallow, disallow the exemption if the money has not come back within a, a reasonable time and their definition of reasonable time is uh it has to be come before you file the return right income from sale of listed shares and uh, dividends uh, received uh, or passed through dividends are also exempt from income tax Uh, Niranjan, are my slides visible? Are they moving? Uh, yes, yes, they are. Okay, yes, right, are. right. So we move on to so we have your sources of income now, and we moved. We took a look at the deductible expenses, some uh, main features, and now and we then took a look at some uh, exemptions relevance. Now we go to reliefs. So we have you have exemptions, and now we have reliefs. So these are the reliefs that are afforded under the new Indian Revenue uh, Act. Some of them. Sharmin, what? Sorry to interrupt. What's the heading of the slide you're on right now? Reliefs. No, no, it's not moving. The previous one moved, but now we're. It's not moving to reliefs. Okay, just let me try sharing it again. Yeah, no, yeah. Now we're now we're good. Okay. So uh, under the New England Revenue Act, we have uh, reliefs which are afforded for uh, personal income taxation. So the first relief, of course, is your personal relief, which is your tax-free allowance of a three million per year of assessment, which works out to approximately two hundred fifty. Not approximately, it works out to two hundred fifty thousand per month. and this relief is available to both tax residents and citizens who are not tax residents of sri lanka then we have rent relief so if you remember uh, i mentioned as part of your investment income you may have rent income that is by uh, renting out income you get on renting out property you are also afforded a rent relief that is uh, you are allowed to deduct 25% of your total income as a relief as an expenditure relief uh, and uh, uh, in addition to that of course you can deduct your rates also paid on the rent but in addition to the rates you have this 25% of uh, um uh, deductible expenditure on your total income that is available only to tax residents then you have expenditure relief now these are reliefs and then you have another category called expenditure relief and it is available only to tax residents of sri lanka i'll take you through that that is a new introduction which came in effective january 2020 So uh in addition to your tax free allowance of 3 million you have an expenditure relief of 1.2 million per year of assessment so if you if you use this 
uh, uh, properly and uh, if you use this intelligently you can actually uh, exempt up to 4.2 million of your income from being chargeable to tax okay so the tax free allowance 3 million and then you have an additional expenditure relief of 1.2 so there are four categories under which you can deduct expenses uh, which has to tot which can total up to 1.2 million the first is health expenditure including contributions to medical insurance scheme so these uh, uh, i must mention that these uh, um, this expenditure relief actually came in through a web notice issued in january uh, effective january 2020 and it has not been yet amended or included in the law and there are some uh, questions that uh, do come up the parameters so haven't been ex uh, defined as yet correctly or has not been defined properly we will only know that conclusively once the law is introduced but for the moment the broad guidelines are given and one is health expenditure including contribution to medical scheme so uh, health expenditure you can deduct your uh, medication uh, from the pharmacy uh, even your vitamins we were told uh, of course you need to have uh, ideally you need to keep maintain your receipts and your prescriptions the premium uh, contribution to your to a medical insurance can be deducted here again a question arose whether uh, if an, uh, there is an in insurance plan, uh, investment plan where you have both life and medical cover, whether the premium on that plan can be deducted. But there, it was clarified verbally to us uh, that uh, that such such schemes will not be permitted. It is only a pure medical insurance scheme, and the premium paid that that will be deducted. So these things would probably be defined when the law comes out. Then you have education expenditure incurred locally uh, for your individual, for the individual, and on behalf of his or her children. So education in expenditure incurred locally. So this would uh, imply that your foreign expenditure you pay and uh, any foreign membership fees you pay on, on behalf of professional bodies would not be deductible. Uh, you can deduct your um, other uh, educational expenditure for your further studies and even expenditure on, on behalf of your children. Now, here again, children have not has not been defined on the age limit has not been given yet in the broad guidelines. But it is our understanding that it will probably be limited to children up to the age of 25 years um, and uh, any ex expenditure, educational expenditure incurred up until that age would be permitted as a deductible expense. Then interest paid on housing loans. So any housing loans you take, the interest you pay on that will be deductible. Contributions made to an approved pension scheme. So these are these schemes that would be you know, afforded by uh, the private sector where you can contribute uh, to a pension plan. So the, the, the contributions to such plan would be deductible. The idea Shami, here is that- Shami, sorry to interrupt. You have two minutes. Sure. And uh, we have the fifth category, which is the expenditure incurred for uh, purchase of equity security. Uh, which is which will be mostly listed your listed security, which are, will be defined later on as well. You have also some other qualifying payments, uh, which are donations to charitable uh, approved charitable institutions and donations made to the government, and uh, certain undeductible balances brought forward from the previous uh, previous act, which are not really relevant to uh, mostly to individuals. Then you have your tax compliance dates, so. Uh, the tax payments now have to be made on a self-assessment uh, basis and there are four dates which starts on the 15th of August, 15th November, 15th February, 15th May and the final payment which is due on 30th September. Uh, I would like to here at this point mention that we are also required to file a statement of estimated tax payable on the 15th of August of uh, commencing of the each year of the assessment. This is where you give an uh, estimation to your to the department in a prescribed format of your estimated income and expenditure and taxable income and your liability. And accordingly, you're supposed to discharge your self-assessment payments for the four quarters. You can revise this statement uh, anytime during these quarters, uh, but it is a must that you file this and there is a penalty for not filing this. So these are the penalties uh, broadly for uh, not meeting your tax compliance uh, uh, obligations. If you do not, if you fail to register, if you have a taxable income of more than three million and you do and you fail to register, your penalty is fifty thousand. A late filing of return, you have a maximum penalty of four hundred thousand. Uh, there is a penalty on taxes paid late, which is twenty percent, and then uh, uh, on sorry on the on the installment payments paid late, there is an immediate penalty of ten percent. Uh, and there's an interest charge also thereafter. Uh, and the most important thing, I'll just take you to this. 
this is the section 185 under which uh, you can be uh, penalized for not filing your set form or your even your return and there the penalty can be 1 million so the department has the uh, option of coming under this section and getting you to pay 1 million of course uh, the commissioner general has to give you no notice first and give you a 30 day period to comply and then charge the 1 million but please be mindful of this penalty so you have the interest also which would be charged in addition to the penalty Shandin, I have to stop you there for sure. a bit, and we can probably okay. pick it up during the question and answer session. Sure. Um, thank you very much for that informative presentation. Sorry to cut you off abruptly. Our next That's topic right. is capital gains tax. Uh, Mr. Suresh Pereira, over to you. Uh, thank you, Niranjan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Let me begin by thanking uh, the Bar Association for inviting me to uh, participate in this uh, highly successful uh, series of webinars and I will uh, speak to you with regard to capital gains tax uh, in Sri Lanka within the next 15 minutes. Uh, right now, what is capital gains tax and how important is capital gains tax? Now, everybody is excited about this tax called capital gains, but how important is this? Now, I looked at the uh, looked at it from the state, from the point of view of the state. That's basically the revenue collection during the last few years. Now, what we can see is this tax during the first year in operation, that is, it, uh, it comes from 1st of uh, April 2018. During the first year of operation, it generated only 0.01% of the total revenue collected by the Inland Revenue Department. And when it comes to the second year, that is the 2019 year, also, uh, what is the collection? That's 0.06% is the total collection from the capital gains tax uh, according to the performance report uh, published by the Inland Revenue Department. So that basically gives you an idea how important this tax is to the state. Uh, we, uh, no, V8 is the highest revenue generator in the country and in the two, according to the 2019, again, the performance report of the Inland Revenue Department, it has generated 43% of the total collection by the Commissioner General. And income tax is the second highest revenue generator, that is 36%. And how much is capital gains tax? 0.06%. So now that gives an idea as to how important this tax is to the state. But this is the tax that we are all talking about, all excited about capital gains tax. Okay, now when I say, to me basically, I don't know why this tax has been introduced uh, when you look at the collection and also not only the collection, even when you look at the uh, target that was given in the 2019, it was uh, 2 billion. And uh, normally, uh, I think in the 2018, our collection was 900 billion, somewhere around that. And 2 billion was the target. Out of that also, only 30% was achieved. And that's something like 600 million. And that 600 million constitute only 0.06% of the total revenue collection. So I don't think uh, this tax is worth uh, even uh, discussing from the point of view of the state, right? But from the point of view of individuals, this is something that we all get scared of. We are all curious about. So let's quickly have a look at what why this tax was introduced uh, at the big at, uh, why this was tax was introduced. What is the rationale for that? Kanuja mentioned uh, with regard to this uh, uh, the tax revenue. Uh, how do you say that? This this section in uh, direct tax to indirect tax uh, tax collection the ratio. Direct taxes bring in only less than twenty percent of the taxes and that's income tax. And that's one motive why uh, capital gains tax was also introduced, thinking that will uh, increase the direct tax collection in the country and how it has been successful during the last two years. Uh, the numbers uh, speaks, uh, is right. And the other reason why this was introduced, uh, that uh, there was a, there was a uh, how do I say, a feeling. Uh, the, re the appreciation of the real estate in Sri Lanka. So people are buying and selling land, people are buying and selling condominium units, and that has created a new rich class in the country. And we need to tax uh, this class somehow, we have to collect a uh, tax from this class, and therefore capital gains tax is the right tax to collect taxes from that, from them, and that is the reason, uh, that is the second reason why capital gains, uh, I think, uh, was introduced in the country. And at that time, I can recall, uh, there was a World Bank report uh, that was uh, published also, uh, uh, highlighting the, the gap between the rich and the poor. So capital gains tax was considered the right tool to 
uh, address those issues. But after two years of operation, we can see how far it has been successful. Right now, so that's the, how do I say, uh, the operational aspects uh, with regard to tax. Now let's move on to the technical aspect. What is this capital gains tax? Now, this is not something novel, something uh, something that has been introduced uh, for the first time in Sri Lanka. Capital gains tax, in fact, was introduced somewhere in 1957 for the first time. And from 1957 to 2002, this used to be a tax uh, in the income tax regime in Sri Lanka. And in 2002, it was uh, abolished. And in 2018, again, this was introduced. Though we call it capital gains tax, this is not a separate tax. This is not a distinct tax. This is a part of the Inland Revenue Act. And there is a separate chapter, chapter four of the Inland Revenue Act uh, that has been, uh, that was introduced uh, when the new Inland Revenue Act was introduced. And that title of that chapter is Realization of sorry, Gains and Losses from Realization of Assets and Liabilities. In that chapter, uh, there's a methodology given, methodology set out as to how to calculate gain or loss on realization of asset or liability. Now, that's not something that was actually con contemplated by the legislature, or our parliament, our policy makers, uh, actually, to my understanding. What happened was, uh, I can recall in 2017 budget speech, uh, there was a reference to introduced uh, capital gains tax uh, at the rate of uh, 10% restricted to uh, less than uh, property held for less than 10 years and also only on immobile property. But when the act was introduced, what we have seen is something totally different from what the budget speech pronounced, 2017 budget speech pronounced. It's not just uh, immobile property, it extends to now immobile property uh, and all sorts of uh, assets also, not only the assets, even the liabilities. And not just the concept of sale, it captures the concept of realization. Now, realization has a very wide uh, definition given in the Inland Revenue Act. It's not just sale, right? So it, it goes on to cover uh, the concept of, how do I say, parting with the ownership uh, is one aspect there. So you can part with the ownership, the title by sale, exchange, uh, even the words like redemption, there are a plethora of words that are included under that particular heading of the concept of realization. Not only that, when a person ceases to exist, that means in case of a company, when a company is put into liquidation, or when in case of a natural individual, if the person happens to pass away, and immediately before his death, that uh, uh, that is also considered, uh, that, also, that incident is also captured under this definition of uh, realization. So the magic word here is the realization. Capital gains uh, tax, what we call, or uh, part of that is is getting triggered because of this incidence called realization. So it has a wide uh, definition and uh, not just there. So that's something that we need to uh, keep in mind. And uh, I'm not going to go into the full details with regard to the definition of uh, realization, but that's something that we need to keep in mind. It's not simple uh, aspect of, or the, not a simple incidence of sale of an article. It's much more than that. Right, so then when we go to uh, so realization of an asset or liability. Now, uh, now here the main, main important thing to understand capital gains tax is that we have to understand under the new Indian Revenue Act, all the assets that we have in our hand are, uh, can, be, yeah, can be divided into uh, different categories and put into different baskets. I, I would say categories, the classification of assets, right? So you can have trading stocks, depreciable assets, capital assets used in the business, then the capital assets uh, held for investment and other assets. Now that's the uh, list of, uh, so that's the categorization of the assets that a person holds. Now, this particular category called capital assets held for investment, that's the, uh, basket of assets that will give rise to what is called capital gains tax uh, colloquially. Now, what is a capital asset is also defined in the act. And that definition captures essentially the land and building, uh, ordinary shares, uh, then also, let's see, uh, financial assets or any interest in any of those assets. So there's a, a definition as some of the words, uh, some of the 
uh, some of the goods or the articles or whatever things that are falling within the definition of the capital asset is what I mentioned there. Now, what we have to keep in mind is that definition does not uh, uh, include things like machinery, factory buildings, etc. Right? The capital asset, uh, sorry, factory building may come in, but not machinery. And most of the other, the definition that we had in our minds with regard to capital asset is not important here. Now, there's specific definition given for capital asset in the act, right? Uh, so now if you are holding these assets as an investment, and that is the asset that is going to uh, give rise to this concept of capital gains tax. Now, how do you calculate the capital gains tax? If you take the common incidence, when you sell an asset, say a block of land that you have been holding as an investment asset, and if it gives rise when you sell it, uh, and that you get the selling, you get the sale proceeds coming in, and that should be reduced by the uh, cost. Now, what is the cost? The law has uh, introduced a rule to say that the cost should be the market value as of 31st uh, September 2017. So you have to find the market value of 31st September 2017 and reduce it from the consideration that you receive, let's say, saving price. And uh, on that, 10% should be. Uh, pay to the Indian Revenue Department within 30 days and file a return also. There's a budget proposal that was uh, mentioned uh, that's going to change the normal rule. That is basically under the current act or under the original act, the rule is you have to file for each asset that is uh, realized during the 30 day period, you have to file uh, separate returns and make separate payments, but that has the, the, the budget proposal proposed to simplify that by uh, allowing taxpayers to file one return to capture uh, all the transactions taking place within a month, right? Uh, right, so that's the... Uh, uh, Mr. Breyer, you have two minutes left, unless you... Before I start, really. So, right, so that's <laughs> it. Yeah, so compliance is basically uh, within 30 days, you have to make the payment and file the uh, return and important that you have to keep in mind is the word is realization and what are the subject assets and how do you uh, comply with that and there are penalties and there are exemptions also exemption one of the main key exemptions that uh, you would like to hear is uh, in case of a residence the uh, the house that you use uh, residential the primary primary residence and when that is uh, disposed, uh, if you have been holding on to it for a period of three years and you have been living in there for more than two years, out of those uh, three years, two years, then that is not liable for capital gains tax is something that you have to keep in mind. That is an exemption. And also, uh, there's a threshold also, 50,000 a month or six lakhs a year is also a threshold. And if it is below that, you don't have to pay. But if it is above that, then you have to pay, right? So in a nutshell, those are the basic rules in relation to capital gains tax. Yes, Niranjan, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. Uh, our next topic of discussion is litigation and tax appeals. Uh, Mr. Neomar Gunawardena, over to you. Mr. Gunawardena, I think you're on mute. We can't can you hear, hear me? Now can we hear can me? hear you. Now yeah. we can hear you. Great. Yeah. So uh, the, with regard to the process of uh, litigation or dispute resolution under the Indian Revenue Act, it needs to start off necessarily from the return which you file. And under the new Indian Revenue Act, the terminology is slightly different. The, the return is considered to be a self-assessment, that you, you have assessed yourself on the amount of tax which you need to pay. And on that basis, uh, there is an amount which you have set out in your return as being the amount of tax payable by you. Now, if the Indian Revenue does not, that return needs to be filed by the 30th of November, immediately succeeding the end of the year of assessment. So, for the year uh, 2021, the year of assessment will end on 31st March. Your return would need to be filed by the 30th of November. Now, the Indian Revenue has a period of three years from the date on which you file your return to issue the new terminology is an amended assessment. So when they issue an assessment as we normally call it now, under the new terminology, 
that is referred to as an amended assessment. That is, they are amending your self-assessment. So that needs to be done within three years. And if by some chance they issue that within three years, they have another further period of one year in which they can uh, amend that amended assessment. So actually, they have three plus one in order to uh, issue an amended assessment on you uh, for the return which you have filed. Now, when uh, an amended assessment is issued on you, within 30 days, you can file an appeal. And the terminology once again has changed. The terminology is you can request the commissioner for an administrative review of that assessment. The request is for an administrative review of that assessment. So earlier you would say you would normally appeal to the Commissioner of General Indian Revenue. The new terminology is request for an administrative review of the assessment. The Commissioner General thereafter would be obliged to give you a hearing. And that hearing needs to be completed within a period of 90 days. Now, this is quite different from the current situation where the Commissioner General had a period of two years to determine your appeal. And at the end of the period of two years, currently, if the appeal is not determined, the appeal is deemed to be allowed. Whereas under the new act, the Commissioner General must uh, determine your review process within a period of 90 days. But if he does not complete it within 90 days, it means that you can take your appeal up to the next stage. That is, you can appeal to the Tax Appeals Commission. So therefore, the failure by the Commissioner General to hear your appeal or to determine your appeal does not result in an end of that appeal process, it merely means that you can appeal to the Tax Appeals Commission. Now, that raises some interesting questions because uh, the stage at which the review is requested before the Commissioner General is also the stage at which normally, if any evidence has to be led, you would lead that evidence. So, if by some chance the Commissioner General has not given you that opportunity, or if after giving that opportunity, he has not made a determination, then that raises a question as to what happens to the facts of the case. Because we learn later that eventually beyond a particular stage, it's only questions of law which can be determined by the courts. So with regard to questions of fact, you need to establish it at an early stage, which is ideally the stage of the, uh, the review stage before the Commissioner General. And if by some chance that stage has not been gone through because of the fault on the part of the Commissioner General, right? it might mean that you are before the Tax Appeals Commission uh, without the facts being properly settled. Now, the Tax Appeals Commission, when they receive an appeal from you, uh, within 90 days, once again, they need to determine that appeal. And at the Tax Appeals Commission stage, uh, once again, you need to know some basic principles. One is uh, the rules of evidence don't apply. And secondly, the burden is on the taxpayer to show that the assessment is incorrect. So after the amended assessment is issued, remember, the burden is on the taxpayer to show that the amended assessment is incorrect. So therefore, sometimes it is essential that the facts are clearly established at the earliest possible stage. Because if you need to show at a later stage that the, maybe the Tax Appeals Commission has not considered the facts properly, those all those facts need to be established clearly at a very early stage uh, in this whole process. So the Tax Appeals Commission, uh, once again, would give you a hearing. And uh, at the end of that process, within 90 days, they're supposed to give their determination. Now, currently, that period is 270 days for them to give their decision. But in terms of a decision given by the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal has said that that 270 day period is directory and not mandatory. So therefore, uh, even the 90 day period uh, may be considered to be uh, directory. But uh, once again, the consequences are slightly different because if the Tax Appeals Commission has not determined your appeal within the 90 day period, then in such a case, you are entitled to appeal to the Court of Appeal.
right? And that is, the process is slightly different. Uh, you are supposed to file a notice of appeal. Uh, your appeal would eventually only be on questions of law. So therefore questions of fact uh, generally should have been determined at an earlier stage. On questions of law, uh, the appeal could be proceeded with uh, by the Court of Appeal. And when that notice of appeal is given, uh, like what happens currently, uh, the Tax Appeals Commission would set out the facts and uh, it would generally set out also the matters of law which need to be determined. And uh, on that basis, the Court of Appeal uh, uh, would hear your case. Now, at the Court of Appeal stage, I think uh, from the lawyer's point of view, you need to know generally the process. Uh, there is a date on which the case, case sometimes is listed for support. But however, really there is no question of supporting uh, the matter as such. It's just that uh, on that date, uh, the court makes an order with respect to getting the record from the Tax Appeals Commission. And thereafter, the court would normally ask for written submissions to be filed before the date of argument. So uh, there would be a set of written submissions filed before the date of argument. And thereafter, there would be the arguments. And uh, normally, as it stands now, the court would also maybe ask for written submissions uh, to be filed after the argument is completed as well. So that is the normal process which is filed, which is pro, um, which is followed by the tax appeals commission uh, at the court of appeal. And even at the tax appeals commission stage, remember, written submissions are important. So oral submissions would be permitted, but uh, by and large, your written submissions. And the quality of written submissions is important uh, at all stages, right? And I think uh, at, at lower stages, maybe the evidence which you have in the case needs to be presented. But beyond that stage, maybe at the tax appeals commission stage and at the court of appeal stage, remember, uh, a good set of written submissions is obviously uh, essential. Now, from the court of appeal, you can appeal to the Supreme Court with leave being obtained from the Supreme Court. Uh, once again, in tax cases, leave is not something which is sometimes very easy to obtain. I would think, uh, based on statistics, I would think maybe one in four cases would get leave. So therefore, you would need to have a substantial case in order to get leave from the Supreme Court in order to uh, actually pursue uh, the tax appeal to that stage. So if leave is granted, uh, there would be certain questions of law on which leave has been granted. And then the final hearing before the Supreme Court would take place on the questions of law which have been formulated uh, either at the appeal stage or sometimes reformulated by the Supreme Court at the leave to appeal stage. So it's on that that eventually the arguments would be proceeded with before the Supreme Court. So that is the general process with regard to the hearing of disputes. Uh, but I think the, the, the main point which needs to be noted is that uh, uh, you need to establish your facts by a particular stage in that whole process. You need to have evidence which is presented either in documentary form or even necessary, necessary even oral at a particular stage because beyond that stage, eventually you are only left with matters of law. And it would be difficult to get some uh, matters of fact, which have been determined by maybe the tax appeals commission overturned at a higher stage. Yeah, Niranjan, I think that's what I need to say. I think if there's any questions, we could take it at question time. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gunivardhana. That brings us to the end of our panel discussion. And now let me, uh, we've received some questions from our viewers, so let me direct that to our panelists accordingly. Uh, first up, uh, Mr. Gunawazana, may I ask you, um, the Tax Appeals Commission Act, the Schedule to the Tax Appeal Commission Act mentions certain acts, but the Inland Revenue Act that, was, that came out in 2017 is not a part of that schedule. Do you see that as a problem? And is that something that the legislature should look into? I don't really think it's a problem because uh, when there is a reference in an act to a particular enactment and that enactment is subsequently repealed, then the reference in that act to that other enactment would mean the, the, the act 
which has superseded that earlier. So if there is a reference to the company that number 17 of 82, now all those references in some other act to that act 17 of 82 would mean number 7 of 2007. So I don't think it's a, it, it is a fundamental issue in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gunu, uh, wasn't it? The next question is Mr. S to Mr. Suresh Pereira. Uh, many investors view capital gains tax as a deterrent. Uh, going forward, do you feel that the revenue generated or the positives of the capital gains tax out outweigh this deterrent factor that certain investors seem to perceive? Yes, it's a fundamental principle that you need to analyze the cost and the benefit of any tax. Cost benefit analysis must be carried out. And two years of operation clearly indicate that this tax has not uh, generated uh, revenue. Or basically, to me, it's a total disaster because uh, when you have 0.06% uh, uh, of the total collection coming from capital gains tax, and uh, the, the tax, the message that is going uh, from the tax system is that. We have capital gains tax in Sri Lanka, and that's uh, definitely a deterrent to the investors. And uh, people basically consider that as a red flag. So the investors, uh, uh, when you consider cost-benefit analysis, uh, it's not worthwhile having a, a tax called capital gains tax uh, when we don't uh, get that uh, enough revenue. So definitely, I see that uh, as a uh, as a how do I say a red flag, or maybe. Uh, not a tax that should be in our system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. Uh, next question is to Mrs. Shamin Tilakaratna. This is from a non-resident. Uh, he says, as a non-resident of Sri Lanka, what taxes am I liable to pay and what are the rates? So as a non-resident, you are liable to pay income tax on any income derived in Sri Lanka. It's not on your global income. A resident is liable to tax on your global income. A non-resident is liable to tax on income derived in Sri Lanka. And if you're a non-resident and a non-citizen of Sri Lanka, you will not get that tax-free allowance of 3 million uh, and the expenditure relief as well. And you will be taxed at the progressive rates going up from 6 to 6, 12 to 18 maximum. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tilgran. Another question to you. Now, Section 2 of the Inland Revenue Act requires everyone with a taxable income to file a return. But as the statistics mentioned by Tanuja demonstrate, many, many do not. And some do not on the pretext that it has been withheld at the source. What do you have to say about this? So this is the new amendment that is uh, going to come in and uh, was made effective January 2020. So we have taken out that concept of final tax. Uh, previously, for example, uh, if you had only employment income, interest income, and dividend income, all those three sources would be taxed at source. It was a final tax. You need not file a return. But now, uh, the concept of that final tax has been taken out. Uh, the withholding is not mandatory. It can be done at your request, or you can make it on a self-assessment payment. And therefore, everyone has to file if you reach a taxable income of 250000 per month or 3 million per year of assessment, you need to file an income tax return. And most importantly, if you want to take advantage of that expenditure relief of 1.2 million, the additional expenditure relief of 1.2 million, you need to file the tax return. So in conclusion, everyone now needs to file a tax return if you reach the taxable income threshold. Sharmin, what are the consequences if, if someone continuously does not file a tax return? Uh, what are the consequences? Does the Inland Revenue Act uh, come after you or do they not do it because the cost of recovery for personal income tax is rather high? So, um, as I know, in my presentation, I gave you the type of penalties uh, that the Inland Revenue can impose on you. And in practice, uh, what happens is you may think that you're filing a manual income tax return, but in fact, all that is entered into the system. And once it is entered, it automatically generates any penalties that you have not paid taxes on time. Uh, it automatically gener generates penalties. So there, uh, it is automatic and it will come to you eventually. The other aspect is where you don't file a, a return and you, uh, you know, avoid it, uh, it altogether. 
Now, here under the new act, there are some stringent uh, penalties that can be imposed. One is uh, under Section 185, where it can go up to a 1 million, but there, of course, Commissioner General has to give you notice and uh, to file and to give reason why you did not file and give you a period thereafter to file. So, theoretically, there is a 1 million uh, in penalty that can come there. In addition to that, there is also a section under the New Inland Revenue Act, and I saw this in the uh, press just the other day, that the Commissioner General can name and shame tax evaders uh, as a, in, a, in the tax evaders list. And uh, there was some discussion about actually using that uh, provision. So going forward, we need to be a little mindful. Uh, uh, department will can come after us. Thank you. Thank you, Shambin. Uh, next question to Tanuja Pereira. What drives, uh, you mentioned you mentioned the statistics regarding tax collection. What drives tax policy? Is it revenue generation? Uh, do you look at tax collection and are you trying to make that more efficient? What drives policy? Yeah, uh, policy is driven by, not only by the revenue. Revenue is the major thing. But uh, to uh, encourage investments, and uh, uh, certain, I mean, protect certain industries. Now, I'm not talking about only the in income tax, certain other taxes as well. To protect the domestic industry, you know that uh, now the, uh, there are import restrictions. So to restrict, uh, restrict the imports or to ex encourage the exports, not only the revenue, the, the tax policies are driven uh, not only by the revenue, but certain other things like protecting domestic industries, uh, encouraging investments, and likewise. Thank you, Danuja. Uh, next question is to Mr. Suresh Pereira. It says, uh, in the case of capital gains tax, how can we determine the value or cost available as at 30th September 2017? Yeah, this is a very important uh, point. As I mentioned, uh, in case of capital gains tax, uh, how do you calculate the gain? It's a consideration minus the cost, and the cost is the uh, market value as of 30th uh, September 2017. So how do we ascertain that? The Indian Revenue Act does not give a uh, specific methodology as to how to do it. So it's basically how we do it. If it's a land, then we need to go to a, a valuer and uh, do the valuation certificate and keep. Now, there is no, again, I have told you, there's no mandatory rule to say that you have to do this thing. But if you don't do that thing, uh, you will be at the uh, mercy of the Commissioner General someday when you are realizing the asset, when you are selling the asset. So it's very important now itself, if you have not done already, if you have your in, if you have land, etc., the investment assets, do a valuation, keep it with your transfer deed, uh, with your title deeds, and keep because that's the key. Uh, requirement going forward uh, when you are going to sell the land. So there's the answer, the answer to that, uh, Niranjan, is there's no specific methodology yes. given. Basically, you need to, the best that we can do in case of land, of course, is to do a, uh, get, to a, get, a get a value and do the valuation and keep the valuation certificate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. Uh, next question is Mr. to Mr. Neomar Gunawardhana. Now, uh, when you are going against the decision of the Tax Appeal Commission, you mentioned the notice of appeal and questions of law. So the questions of law, this is something that has to be submitted to the Tax Appeal Commission. And then thereafter, that gets sent to the litigant and it goes to the Court of Appeal as a stated case. How does that happen, the questions of law? No, no. Under the, under the new act, uh, generally, it'll be like a civil appeal. Notice of appeal will be filed in the Court of Appeal. And then the Tax Appeals Commission would be noticed together with the Commissioner General Indian Revenue. And the Commissioner General, sorry, the Tax Appeals Commission is required to set out almost what is currently contained in the case stated. They would need to uh, send it to the, to the Court of Appeal. So it seems to be that the process is uh, that uh, you would file your notice of appeal directly in the Court of Appeal. And then with notice to the Commissioner General and the Tax Appeals Commission, and then the Tax Appeals Commission on that basis would uh, set out uh, certain requirements in relation to that case and send it to the Court of Appeal. That's they need to set out the facts, questions of law, like what is currently done in the case stated. Thank you, Mr. Gunawardana. Our next question is to uh, Shamin. 
uh, it says expenses expenses of purchase of equity means total purchase consideration or administration charges and commission of share broker not quite sure if you yeah no i understand uh, the question that is being asked is uh, what is the deductible expenditure under that qualifying relief is it just it is is it the cost of uh, purchase of the equity securities the securities or can you also deduct uh other incidental costs such as administration charges commission to the share broker and so on so the answer there is as i mentioned earlier uh it's still not available in the law we have been only given broad guidelines i'm sure the parameters will be defined more detail in future but as of now we have been told that yes not only are you able to deduct the cost of uh, purchase of the equity but also the incidental expenditure related to that Uh, investment meaning the share broker costs and any administrative costs bank charges and so on thank thank you shamin uh the next question is to mr suresh pereira regarding capital gains tax tax it says uh if a person having only a business and a source of income and any asset or property sales is this subject to capital gains tax i think yeah the question is not that clear but let me explain yeah. Yeah. the concept of capital gains tax is in relation to an investment asset that is a capital asset held for investment now there is a definition for capital asset as i mentioned earlier covering land building uh, ordinary shares uh, financial assets and any interest in any of those uh, things and that could be so for instance you can hold the uh, hold the you can you can be using the land in your business in that case it's called capital uh, asset uh, used in the business now when you sell that piece of land uh, the gain that you get is not considered is not called a capital gains it's it's basically uh, going under your business income but if you are holding that land for investment purposes as an investment asset when you sell that land the gain that you get is what we call it is called as a uh, investment uh, sorry as a capital uh, capital gain so you need not have a business uh, to be exposed to ca capital gains tax all you need to do is to all you all all this should be is basically a investment asset and you are holding that as you are holding a capital asset for investment and that there is a realization in which case uh, yes the capital gains tax will come the consideration minus cost uh, as a, the gain to be taxed at the rate of 10%. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Pereira. Um our next question is to Mr. Neymar Gunawardena. It, it says in a situation where the Commissioner General of Inland Revenue does not respond to an administrative review within 90 days, how long does the taxpayer have to prefer an appeal to the Tax Appeal Commission? Yes, that that's an interesting question because there is no time period mentioned there. so therefore uh, there is no time period mentioned in the act itself so after 90 days have lapsed you are entitled to file an appeal to the tax appeals commission so therefore uh, the main problem is that uh, the mere filing of an appeal does not stop the collection process or recovery process so if by some chance you don't file your appeal to the tax appeals commission right at some point of time they might initiate the recovery process and eventually you might need to pay the tax so there is no time period mentioned there uh, with regard to they don't give you the decision within 90 days as to what sort of within what sort of time you need to appeal it is open thank you mr gunawardena and uh, you mentioned that most of the time bar that is Uh, the 90 days and the 270 days they are directory and and not mandatory according to the judgment of the court of appeal so in terms of uh, in terms of con in terms of consequences for the taxpayer i mean it's in the taxpayer's best interest that it's determined in that period nothing nothing flows from that right from the time bar typically yes so currently as as it stands now there is a two year time bar for the commission general to hear a tax appeal and that section says if it's not heard within two years it's deemed to be allowed okay. so that those are very strong words and the tax appeals commission also has a 270 day period to hear an appeal 
that period has been held to be directory. Now, under the new act, what's happening is these 90 day periods don't result in any consequences. It only means that if the decision is not made within that period, you can go and appeal to the next stage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gunavadana. Our next question is to uh, Tanuja, Tanuja Pereira. You mentioned that the percentage of direct taxes to indirect taxes is approximately 80 to 20. Uh, is the government or looking at it from a policy standpoint to change that proportion in line with countries within the region and elsewhere? Yes. Uh, now, uh, if you take the recent policy revisions, uh, you, uh, the VAT rate brought down to 8%. Uh, and uh, uh, you can increase this direct tax to indirect tax ratio by increasing the direct taxes as well as reducing the indirect taxes. But uh, for the moment, I don't think, uh, I mean, uh, although the government has planned to have increased these direct taxes, now uh, we put only the income tax in the direct tax basket and all other taxes are taken together and treated as indirect taxes. Now, since this new SGT or the special goods and service tax is uh, will be in enforced in within another few weeks or few months time, then again the uh, although the VAT rate brought down, the indirect tax rate again will go uh, tax uh, revenue again will go up. Uh, so the I don't see uh, in recent time this rate will get cha changed. This ratio will get changed. Because uh, the uh, the SGT is applicable, the sectors uh, that will come under the SGT regime contributes more than uh, forty percent of the tax revenue of the country. So in that case, I don't see that the ratio will change in uh, near future. Thank you, thank you, Tanuja. Our next question is to Mr. Suresh Pereira. It says. Uh, when we have long-term foreign fixed deposit, are any exchange rate gains liable uh, under capital gains tax? Right, it's a good question. But uh, what I would do is I will give you the decision uh, criteria that should be looked at but without giving a conclusion because this can be a controversial issue. Uh, so first, to trigger capital gains tax, first there has to be a uh, capital asset held for investment. So we have to check and see with this. Uh, fixed deposit that we are talking about is that a uh, capital asset uh, held for investment. So, what is a capital asset definition? Uh, among uh, other things, there is uh, securities and uh, and financial asset also included in the definition of a capital asset. So, if that is basically falling within that, then the next question is: Is there a realization? Section thirty nine goes on to give uh, the definition of realization. Uh, so, we need to test uh, that and see whether there is a realization taking place. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. Uh, next question is to Sharmin. The question is, if someone takes a, a home equity loan to construct a house, uh, can is that tax deductible? Uh, again, I'd just like to reiterate that uh, uh, the exact parameters have not been defined for this expenditure relief. At the moment, the broad guideline is any interest uh, paid on a, a loan taken to construct a house. So as of now, uh, the answer would be yes. Uh, even if it is a personal loan, uh, uh, if it is for the construction of the house, it can be deducted. Uh, but we will get more guidance once the law is out. So we just no, be mindful of that. Yeah, they are, they are, I think what we have to keep in mind is uh, earlier when the housing loan interest deduction was available in the law, the Department of Indian Revenue did not allow interest on personal loans uh, to be deductible. Correct. And they insist that it should be uh, housing loans. So housing loans. Right now, what we have is uh, a pronouncement made by the policymaker, a web notice or a press notice. We don't have the exact laws, but we have to wait and see how uh, this will get uh, drafted into the law and what the what will be the approach of the Inland Revenue Department. Hopefully, personal loans taken for housing purposes should also be given. Thank you. Um, our next question is, this is specifically directed to Mr. Neomar Gunavardhana. It says, pursuant to a merger or an acquisition, when the uh, assets of the company that cease to exist are transferred to the surviving company, 
uh, uh, what are the tax implications? Or is... yeah, I think I was talking about tax disputes, I think, right? right? So these yeah. are, I think, uh, practical uh, issues, uh, which I think Suresh also can contribute to. Yes, please. Uh, so therefore, that will depend on uh, the assets and also uh, what the merged entity is. So there is a section 46 uh, of the Indian Revenue Act, which may have some application and uh, things like that with regard to the continued ownership uh, by the shareholders. So it would depend on how the merger is actually going to take place. And uh, based on that, there may be uh, some opportunities to defer the tax uh, at the stage of the transfer of the assets. Uh, Mr. Pereira, would you like to add to that? Yeah, it's a it's, a, it's an interesting area. Uh, now, first is we need to ask what is a manager, what is an amalgamation, and we don't have any definitions. So what is the incident uh, that actually we are talking of? That's one. And then thereafter, we have to ask, okay, what is the exact legal nature of this particular transaction or this incident that we are talking of? Uh, does this fall within the scope of the Inland Revenue Act? Is this, uh, is this a transmission by operation of law or, and not a transfer? So the foreign uh, case law in relation to this aspect uh, with regard to amalgamation or merger or according in their company tax. And the cases go on to point out that uh, there is no transfer as such. It's basically uh, by operation of the law, a transmission that takes place. And overall, basically, when you look at uh, the decided case laws outside Sri Lanka, it's basically a tax neutral or income tax uh, neutral incidences but it's basic that is uh, there mm. how it's uh, being looked at at the inland department is an interesting question and uh, as Neumal rightly pointed out uh, there are certain sections in the inland revenue act also the current inland revenue act uh, in relation some sometimes you may be you may be able to use the sections also and uh, it's overall how the inland revenue department will look at this uh, transaction and uh, if I may analyze the history, the approach of the Inland Revenue Department, once upon a time, they looked at the, mm, this incident as a, there was no difference uh, the way in a, from a sale of a business to amalgamation, the Inland Revenue Department did not see a difference. But then when the consolidation of the financial institutions uh, scheme was in operation uh, sometimes back, not, not the recent one, the one before, and there were the certain guidelines that was issued by the Inland Revenue Department in relation to the amalgamations. And there was indication to point out uh, or to, to direct to point out that the department was uh, in agreement that uh, there is no uh, tax, but that was not uh, very certain in relation to that. And now we have to wait and see what's going to be the approach under the new Inland Revenue Act. I hear that uh, uh, there are one or two private rulings that have been issued, uh, but overall, uh, I think uh, it's a gray area uh, approach of the Inland Revenue Department. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pereira. That brings us closer to uh, time. But before we conclude, do the panelists have any questions for each other? Or is there any key area that we could not cover that we can possibly address? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to make a one statement in relation to, again, the policy issues. I think the town, but the town just mentioned also. Now, town just basically mentioned that maybe in few weeks or maybe in few months, uh, there will be a new tax, uh, special uh, special uh, GSC. And this is something that was mentioned at the uh, budget also. And in my view, I think this is not the best way to basically uh, do uh, such a drastic change in the tax regime. If you are introducing a new tax, you need to make available the draft uh, of the act as a white paper to the uh, relevant stakeholders so the stakeholders can uh, give their feedback so that uh, the policymakers can take right decisions and implement a proper system, a proper tax, uh, so that there will not be enough, there will not be requirement to amend it from time to time. Now, what is going to happen again is nobody has uh, seen this uh, as of now. Today is the 5th of March, and according to what I have gathered also, it's going to be implemented from 1st of April. I don't know if it will happen, and nobody is ready for this. Nobody is ready for this. So uh, this process happened uh, in uh, India also, right? It's basically the consolidation of, uh, I think, more than 
12 taxes uh, into uh, GST, again, goods and services tax. And that process took 10 years. So something that was uh, pronounced uh, somewhere in November and we are trying to implement, uh, in fact, in the November budget speech, it was said that it will be from 1st of January. Uh, I don't think the country is ready. And I think it's not the way to uh, implement uh, taxes. There should be a dialogue with the stakeholders and uh, thereafter, uh, the proper legislation should be introduced rather than uh, introducing things overnight without any dialogue. And there, there will be enough and more, uh, how do I say, the lobbying and uh, uh, changes to be made uh, there after, after introduction, which should not be the case. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Tanuja, I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you want <laughs> to add to that or not? Uh, no, I agree with Mr. Suresh because since it is going to be a new tax, and and if you take these sectors, those are uh, the, I mean the the, uh, the basis because liquor and the vehicles, two different sectors, and the telecommunication. So since these are different sectors, we are uh, wondering what would be the basis, and who is going to collect these things, and there are issues. So I think it's best, better to be open for the discussion before implementing, before bringing to the law. So I think, uh, and uh, that that's what I mentioned earlier as well, uh, that Niranjan, uh, once it is, at, at least since we don't have it in our hand, the, the draft is not available. You can, uh, I mean, be vigilant on the, uh, to look into this uh, gasset, uh, once it is published as a gasset, and see whether there are any uh, uh, adverse uh, repercussions on the stakeholders, then you have to, uh, I mean, they had to come out and make suggestions, at least before it is uh, presented in the parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Tanuja. Uh, with that, we've come to the end of our webinar on tax law and insights. And I would like to take this opportunity to extend a special thank you to each and every one of our esteemed panelists for taking time off their busy schedule to be with us. Thank you. And also a special thank you to the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for organizing this webinar and continuing to do so for several consecutive weeks. Thank you. Thank you.